to them. Obviously, gender, location, political persuasion aren't quite unique aspects of anyone. But if you start to put those together, you can really fine tune the way you package data and, and, and target someone. And you can appeal to someone according to the characteristics or the preferences of that particular person. Um, third cognitive model here, the social proof following the herd. If uh, will, I, will I adopt an inch, but will it persuade me or not? One kind of metadata is the number of people who actually believe it. So it's the following the herd. Manifestations of social proof, public opinion, consensus, and so on. So if someone can provide evidence of widespread support, then an individual, many of us, will conform, will feel pressure to conform to group opinion or to larger social opinion. Examples of this uh, sometimes are astroturf in the political arena. Uh, there'll be rather particular special interests who try to make their particular position appear as if it has wide, wide backing. It's more widely shared than it actually is. So it's, it's a more social validity and more likely to be adopted. So in general, the persuader's strategy, we're still in the dimension of psychology and communications, uh, persuader's strategy is to provide persuasion inputs to, to, the, to, the, to the user that match or fit the user's cognitions in such a way that the user uh, changes their decisions, their opinions, their ethics, what they like and dislike to achieve persuasion. Okay, we haven't talked about the internet yet. This is this stuff's been going on since you know Greek democracy. Aristotle is a good textbook on this stuff. Now let's bring it up today with the internet. Um, and here the challenge: if we still have the persuader trying to influence the user's mental states, the challenge for the persuader is to manipulate the internet uh, so that the if I'm the, the user, I'm staring at the screen, uh, the person trying to influence me to persuade me can try to influence data, manipulate data on the internet in such a way that it comes to me and, and influences me in some of the ways that I mentioned earlier. So I'll distinguish here between the manipulator and the persuader a little bit. A persuader is someone perhaps who's dealing directly with me. An, a manipulator or information manipulator is someone who's somewhere on the internet and is affecting what comes to me online attempt to then persuade. So the manipulator manipulates information on the internet to generate persuasion inputs. I've struggled with the terminology. It's probably still going to be confusing, but I'm making a distinction between information outputs from the internet, that, which become inputs to my whole persuasion psychology. How do you generate, what, what kind of things are persuasion inputs? It's skewed choice sets, evidence about the speaker, metadata about the speaker, evidence of societal, of widespread, or how holding on certain all of which can be, this kind of data and information can be generated on the internet uh, using various applications. So the persuader manipulates internet applications to reach the user to deliver those persuasion inputs and hopefully, from this point of view, change the, the user's opinions. Uh, here, app, uh, internet applications figure prominently. Between the manipulator out there and the screen that's ultimately coming to me, um, the, between the manipulator and the user, manipulator provides input, inputs to an application from using Google or from using Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, and the application generates the outputs that become persuasion inputs. And I'll look at some of the applications. Again, you can, this applies to almost any application we use. Some of the biggest ones that we use most commonly, Google search or any other search. Amazon with its reviews that are up there posted by users. Twitter, giving a sense of what's going on. Um, so now we'll look at some of these applications. I'm an inter we're, we're now looking at the information manipulator trying to <clears throat> manipulate an application in such a way that it will go on to influence me, the user, and persuade me. Uh, Google search, pretty straightforward. Google search outputs are the, provide me as a user, when I see the results of the Google search, I, I'm getting a choice set quite often. Whether it's buying, whether it's information that I think is important or so on, I rely on Google to give me a limited set often the, just the first page for many of us. And from that, I assume I've got a pretty good insight into the world that stands in for universal knowledge, and then I choose from among that. So there's a lot of opportunities for manipulation there of the information. If you can manipulate Google search and what it returns to the user, you can affect their choice set and affect the final decision that they make. And of course, influencing the results of Google search is by now a medium-sized industry called search engine optimization. I wonder how many millions of dollars go into this. It's, there's advertisements in my daily newspaper that advertise these functions. 
There's a lot of investment going on in influencing uh, the choice sets that get presented to users. And the, what comes out of Google, the application output, becomes the persuasion input. It's my choice set. I then, if I'm acting as a rational max, utility maximizer, I choose, choose from the choice set. Of course, it's a skewed choice set. So I keep choosing Dick Cheney as my vice president. And, uh, and that's, if so, then the, the information strategy has been successful in affecting the user. Applic another application where we see this uh, Amazon reviews. We see um, um, reviews coming out, manipulation of, of Amazon. What is it that, that Amazon, uh, it's not so much that people write eloquent reviews on Amazon, or I'm convinced necessarily about what they say. It's I have a great deal of, I have more confidence in Amazon because of the neutrality, or the Amazon gives me some degree of assurance that the uh, recommendations and judgments that I'm getting on Amazon are neutral. Uh, these are other people who've reviewed it. They have a certain experience. They're not trying to sell me something. Uh, they communicate opinions that are neutral, and that increases my trust. I'm more likely to believe that. I don't know about you when you go to Amazon, but there's the publisher's review of the book, and then there's the user reviews of the books. And sometimes the user reviews have a higher degree of trust of the, of the, of the consumer. Of course, we're familiar now with bogus reviews that are out there, false neutrality, right? There's a big payoff to getting your, to advocating your, advocating to the user, but under the identity of a neutral fellow consumer. So uh, where the user trusts neutral information. So the value of that information is higher because it's, it has metadata attributes that's neutral. Um, so the user chooses a preferred option but it might be the manipulator's preferred option if the manipulator has successfully disguised uh, his or her opinion as a neutral Amazon review. Uh, Twitter is a uh, you know another application out there provides certain information about the world, instant opinions, a kind of window on the world, a bit of a stand-in for public opinion. Sometimes you uh, assessments going out there, and they can often have the, the if there's a lot of uh, chatter, a lot of commentary. It can give you some sense of what other people who are interested in this topic think about. And of course, it is, it is also um, open to manipulation. Uh, the sock puppets, false users, false accounts being created. To create a lot of chatter, possibly the appearance of a consensus or a group opinion that a certain candidate is good at a certain event is significant, and so on. So you can generate bogus social opinion. And if that matches a user's propensity to go to be, to value public opinion, social opinion, they can be influenced uh, by the content that's coming across Twitter as well. So the user may adopt opinions that quote unquote everyone else holds when the everyone else dimension has in fact is the product of manipulation. So in this way, again, as in the previous two, the output, the desired output from the point of view of the manipulator is the user chooses the manipulator's preferred option. But that's really what we're, what we're targeting here. And there's many more, lots of different applications out there that users are using, everyone create, creates, provides an opportunity for manipulation uh, to produce, if you can produce the outputs that feed into the user's cognitive processes. Uh, the application outputs are persuasion inputs. They correspond, they can, they can fit various cognitive heuristics and may persuade the user. Uh, so that you can get a general strategy of inquiry. Um, and this is kind of what I'm giving to my uh, RA these days. It's like, okay, Let's make a list of lots of cognitive heuristics, the way that people make decisions. Let's make a list of lots of applications that people use, and let's see how uh, different applications can generate outputs that, that feed into different heuristics. You know, whether it's Google, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, and then rational choosing, uh, appeals to friendship, claims of expertise, public opinion, it's actually, be quite a long, a long list and a large matrix of things. Um, let me say that uh, one of the things that's been interesting for me here today that I'm, I'm doing a sort of top-down deductive approach, right? So what I'm, I'm listening to the talks here and I'm trying to sort of locate people in different boxes. What's interesting for me are, are there boxes that I'm not hearing people do research on? Hmm, maybe maybe we'll go there. We'll find some interesting stuff. This is a kind of suggestive analytical framework where I'm deductively arriving. At a, at a large number of possible areas of manipulation, whether they're there or not, I'm not quite sure. So should, with this idea, okay, we can conceptualize uh, and think about 
information manipulation and persuasion. Now it's going to become empirical. How would you detect it if it's going on? It could happen all these ways. How do you detect it? Let me say that my role right now has not been very empirical, so I'm not very involved in the detection part. But um, so far, you know, I've been talking about deduction. What I said, that given the various cognitive heuristics with their corresponding strategies for persuasion, we can anticipate manipulation strategies. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm anticipating that for every time I come up with a new heuristic, I can go hunt for it in various applications. I think I'll, I'll find it. Um, so I can hypothesize it'll be there. I expect to find manipulation in various places. I can even design. If I don't find it, I can become an information manipulator and say, OK, in Facebook, how can I do more expertise-based strategies? I uh, can design them. But the deduction is different, right? So this is what most of you are doing. You know it's there, and you're trying to figure out how to detect it. How do you, uh, the detection employs induction. How do you detect manipulation? Given that people are creating false social proofs, that there's sock puppets out there, we've seen some instances. How do you detect sock puppets? Uh, would you go and look at the, the time profile when the accounts are created? It seems unlikely that a thousand accounts would all be created within a day. That might be an indication that someone's gaming the system. Uh, do you see uh, an opinion put out there and suddenly gets, it's, it's an echo chamber, everyone agrees on it right off the bat? Maybe the temporal signature of Twitter's indicates it doesn't match what we'd expect from real social interaction. So you might have a standard what you expect, the time profile of opinion change to be, and then you notice that the time profile on certain Twitter debates is very different, and you can begin to uh, That might be evidence that manipulation is going on. That's the kind of things that people are talking about today, of course. So can you detect false social proof? Can you detect false attributes of the communicators who are talking? Um, are the, the people who claim to be neutral on, um, on Amazon, are they really neutral or not? Can you do, look at the words that are being used, see patterns of word usage that would suggest that seemingly independent uh, opinions are actually coordinated among themselves? I've certainly uh, noticed that. Uh, maybe with a more trip advisor, you know, you get review after review that thinks the hotel manager is just the greatest person ever. Like, after all, it's like, did the hotel manager write these reviews? You know, them over and, over. and can you actually automate that and look for perhaps the same adjectives being used in probably a uh, number of times? Uh, when you do search results, obviously, can you detect when your search results are in some way not neutral, uh, bobble, and some of the other things we heard about here? Well, do a search in country, do a search outside of country, see what's going on. Uh, do a search from your account, do a search from someone else's account, see what's going on. Create accounts, vary some of the personality attributes of the, of the accounts, conduct searches, see what you get. So those are the methods as well for doing search results that we're getting against these examples here at this conference. Once you've detected them, how do you mitigate them? <clears throat> even if you know <clears throat> that the reviews are bad, uh, gee, what do you do at that point? Even if you know some of the, twi the Twitters are wrong, what do you do? You might, as a software designer, you might try to alert someone. Um, might open another window, hey, there's a different search result that's possible. Maybe you can provide incentives um, on users to, to flag them. Maybe Amazon can do it before users would actually flag them. Like Again, these are, these, in, in, the, in the research project we're doing, we're not, this is, this is happening, but we're at a relatively <coughs> early stage, at least on the grand scale. We've got a number of projects going forward, not, not so many. Uh, okay, so yeah, summary. Like I said up front, this is a conceptual framework. Uh, it's trying to locate lots of individual projects in one overarching framework, using the insights of cognition, cognitive psychology, persuasion research, uh, which has been around a long time, and bringing it in contact with uh, the tools that the internet gives manipulators and persuaders to, 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 to try to persuade us. Um, so we're doing, an, I'm doing an overarching framework. The detection research and the mitigation research is, is, is started in a few spots and it's going on further. I'm working with Nick Feemster, Wanky Lee, Sam Burnett, who's here, and others at Georgia Tech. And the general persuade approach, which I think I probably don't need to repeat at this point, is understanding how people are persuaded through their cognitive heuristics, uh, using that to identify strategies for information manipulation, uh, using uh, that can be pursued on various internet applications, whatever the application is. So the output of, the input, uh, the output of an internet application, 
presents metadata, content data, socially structured data in such a way that it influences the users. So that's, uh, that's my talk. Bottom line, censorship's a big deal, but boy, is there a lot of information manipulation around you. And as you start to look for it, it's surprisingly scary to find, to find it. Thank you.